Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Cook. Welcome once again to another edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook, and with me today is Gary Ferguson. Gary is has written for a variety of national publications, including Vanity Fair, Orion Magazine, the Chicago Tribune, and Los Angeles Times. He's the author of 24 books on nature and science, quite a resume. And in March of 2017, Gary's lead essay for Orion Magazine, titled A Deeper Boom, was selected by the American Society of Journalists and Authors as the best essay of 2016. For the past 20 years, he has given keynote lectures on the ecological and psychological values of nature around the country. He is also a member of the National Geographic Lecture Series, and for 10 years, from 2006 to 2016, he was on the faculty at Rainier Writing Workshop MFA programs at Pacific Lutheran University. Mr. Ferguson, welcome to the program. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be with you. This is uh, this is a beautiful book that reminds us that we don't just live in a concrete jungle, and there's a lot of powerful lessons here. The title is The Eight Master Lessons of Nature, What Nature Teaches About Living Well. But I wanted to start with a point you made in the introduction that's really important to me because I've been uh, studying the HeartMath Institute research about intuition lately. You say that growing our connections to nature will allow us to push past mere intellect to embrace sensory experiences, emotion, and intuition. Say more about that. Well, John, I think that we have, uh, for about 2,000 years now, certainly the last 500, been uh, you know very fond of our intellects, and, and good for us. Uh, we've put them to good use and developed some wonderful things and, and created cultures that are, are very exciting and stimulating. But I think in, in that uh, fidelity to our intellect, we really have uh, grown farther and farther from our relationships with the natural world. And one of the uh, things that psychology is uh, showing us today is that when you do make just even the smallest amount of time to be in the natural world, you start to uh, have an opportunity to open up sensory experiences, whether that's hearing or, or uh, touch or uh, smell. And that actually changes the chemistry of your brain. Um, you know, one of my favorite examples of, of what lies beyond mere intellect has to do with uh, Albert Einstein, of all people. He was researching at Princeton back in the uh, 1920s and 30s, and he had a special little patch of woods he would go to on a regular basis. And once he got there, you know, he wasn't just trying to take a cigarette break. He was uh, actually putting his considerable intellect into trying to imagine all that was going on in that little patch of woods around him, knowing full well he couldn't do it. And what he was actually doing was intentionally trying to blow his mind, uh, get his intellect to the point where it could just simply not comprehend all that was going on. And, and just for a reference point, we still don't know what's going on in, in, in a square yard of dirt, let alone a, a wood. So, you know, we, we haven't made all that much progress in our knowledge. But in that, in that transcending of his intellect, he was able to be in a creative space, he said, that put him in, uh, in much more likelihood of making breakthroughs in the research and the problems he was, he was trying to solve. So these are the kinds of things that wait for us as we rekindle our relationship to the natural world. Mm -hmm. And, and that, uh, that Einstein story is in, in lesson one mystery wisdom begins when we embrace all that we don't know. And I appreciated that Carl Sagan said something about science, uh, uh, wasn't only compatible with mystery, but was the source of it. Yes, yes. And, and Einstein said very much the same. And in fact, he went so far as to tell his students, if you have a choice between uh, knowledge and mystery, always choose mystery, uh, because he was saying basically what Carl Sagan said. And that's that if you do cultivate that kind of relationship, you will find everything you need to uh, assemble a good life in this world, whether it's intellectual life or family life or, or whatever it is you seek. Mm -hmm. So th there there's, there's, seems to be, a, to me, a spiritual component to this, and, and uh, I don't know that we always address that when we're reading pure science. Yeah, I, that, that's very, uh, very true, John. I mean, I don't uh, feel like I, I get too overt with that, but the fact of the matter is, you know, this book came about from me coming to the end of 40 years being in some of the wildest places in the world, and uh, that has been my, my life. And I've learned a lot from nature, and I've certainly learned a lot from the men and women who 
study it as scientists, and as well as some uh, indigenous folks who have uh, opened up my perceptions as well. But looking back at what I learned over those 40 years, that's where the eight lessons came from. But what I was especially um, driven by to, as far as writing this book was not only are these lessons really astonishing and full of wonder and insight about how nature thrives, not just survives, but thrives, how it recovers after uh, disturbance, all of these incredible things. But when you stop and think about it, we too are the natural world. Humans evolved just like everything else. We have a few extra special gifts uh, that uh, some of the other species don't have. But the fact of the matter is the processes that drive our lives, and I would argue our contentment and sense of belonging, um, are not unrelated to what drives the life of the world. And so a lot of our, I think, our problems could be solved if we sort of take the time to realign ourselves with things like the importance of connection, the power of diversity, the wisdom of elders. These are things that are going on in the world all around us, and um, it, it, it holds great power. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I enjoyed getting out in nature and camping as, as a young man, and, and uh, you have spent more time in nature than anyone I've ever read before, uh, uh, walking around the wilderness in the Yellowstone, which is a, a beautiful place to, to, to do that. Um, but in this notion of, of mystery, there was one other note I wanted to make because Rachel Carlson uh, is a Rachel Carson is a hero of mine because of Silent Spring, uh, but mm -hmm. she talks about guiding our children and remembering that um, it would help to remember that it isn't half so important to teach them what to know is how to feel. Oh, that's I think that's so important. Um, you know, we, we are a, a society that puts great stock in, in facts. In fact, our education system has arguably grown exponentially in that area. You know, the tests we take are regurgitation of facts, and there's nothing wrong with that. But what Rachel Carson is talking about is simply opening up um, a child's sense of, of wonder and curiosity. And she claimed, and other scientists uh, since then have claimed as well, that if you allow a child or you provide the opportunity for a child to follow his or her curiosity and sense of wonder and delight, then that will anchor them in uh, a thirst for knowledge. So all the facts and the other things can you know, certainly come later, but it's, it's lighting that spark in the first place. You know, one thing I want to say about that really quickly is psychologists today are, are very fond of saying that, that human beings learn by tr what they call transcending and including. So you don't just leave a phase of your life as you grow older and you know, never touch it again, you simply add to it, you broaden your level of experience. So that very delight and that very sense of wonder that most all of us had when we were three or four or five or six years old, that's still in us. And uh, one of the ways that has been very, very useful for me to spark that in my own life and the lives of the people I know is to get back into that natural world and let it work its magic on us. Mm -hmm. I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, the notes you make about the Greeks and observing and vision versus the other senses and that connection to nature. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's powerful for me what, what, what you articulated there because we've, we're so steeped in that tradition of observation and scientific measurement of things. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, you know, the Greeks were among the first to at least uh, write down how important uh, the simply looking at things were. Uh, theoria is their word for basically regarding or looking at things, and that knowledge would be gained by not only looking, but they put down the idea which Descartes in, in about 1600 really uh, established and entrenched, the notion of subject-object thinking. So we humans are able to understand the world basically by dissecting its component parts, holding things isolated, and then studying their qualities without any acknowledgement or sense of us influencing what we see or not. Now, uh, to be fair, that's led to some very striking scientific discoveries, and we still use it today to great effect. But it's a way of seeing, just relying on vision and the subject-object notion that is very limited. It's very limited. It's not the only way that the world works. It tends to leave human beings, ultimately, if that's the only way they're going to the world, feeling very isolated and alone. And it, it's a way of seeing that naturally makes for wanting to control things. When in fact, 
there are other ways that we could add to that way of seeing that are much more relational and much more anchored in the system that supports us all. You know, I, I love to say that the earth really has our backs and um, the degree to which that's true is, is is showing up all the time. One of the things I mentioned in the book is that when when you are out walking among trees, not only are the trees producing the oxygen you need and you're giving them the carbon dioxide they need, but they're also releasing chemicals called phytoncides, which with every breath you take actually fortify your immune system, strengthen your heart and other vital organs. So this level of connection and relationship is staggeringly complex and really quite beautiful. And uh, it's what allows us to be here and every other life form to be here. Mm -hmm. That's that's a powerful part of lesson two is that there's this garden of connections. And um, the the important fundamental thing about nature is that nothing exists in a vacuum. Nothing exists by itself. It's all interconnected. And and I, I don't think we think it like that very much. No, I think you're exactly right. And, you know, while it was useful to get some of the qualities of the natural world by isolating things, we, we got lost in that, in that habit of isolation. So m- most of us aren't, aren't even capable of seeing beyond that. It's the water. It, we're like fish, and, and separation thinking is the water we swim in. So to the extent people can get out into the natural world and really use their senses to better connect uh, to the extent they can really start to understand and appreciate the level of support they're getting from the life around them, that changes our perspective over time. It it allows us um, to add, besides separation thinking, besides subject-object thinking, a notion of relationality. And and really that will influence um, every aspect of your life as you learn to see more and more in those terms. Mm-hmm. I, I got the impression that, that you feel, as I do, that the Native Americans are a lot uh, better at connecting with uh, uh, the holistic nature of, of the world than we are. And you mentioned uh, the indigenous populations that use more verbs than nouns. That's something else that's interesting to me in terms of how we think about the world. Yes, it, it is interesting. And I'm not sure we can you know, move uh, in, into that particular perspective, but uh, a Native person might say that a uh, spotting a deer on a hillside that um, there is a there is a life form that's deering. It's it's deering. It's in the act of being a deer. And what they're what they're talking about really is that what we see are um, energy and and matter assembled in a certain form that wasn't necessarily in that form before and it won't be there after that particular form dies it will be recycled and turned into something else and of course that has great scientific merit to it because um we we are made up of the stuff that uh came here from the explosion of stars and the carbon that we have in us was uh, perhaps in the dinosaur and the in the ancient redwood and a lot of other uh, life forms along the way to reach our bodies. But they do have a, 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 a very connected way of seeing, not just the, the connection of life and death, but the connection of um, we're in this as part of a fabric of life that cannot exist if we start losing pieces of the puzzle. And that's a, that's a very fundamental aspect of Native American and a lot of indigenous tribes. You know, and I mentioned in the book, I grew up, to be quite honest with you, thinking that, well, these people didn't uh, exploit the natural resources simply because they didn't have the technology and they didn't put their intellects to developing all the smart, clever things that we have. But in fact, um, a lot of those cultures really did have a sense that we are supported by this system of relationships. So if we don't tend these relationships, if we don't take care of them, if we don't acknowledge the importance of the other members, then we will be killing ourselves. Now, you know, climate change may not be killing us, but it's a great example of what can happen if we're too cavalier about um, our actions and the need to, uh, you know, if we forget the need to be um, cognizant of, of the effects of, of what we do on the world at large, that sustains us. That's a great uh, prelude to the, the notion of biodiversity. Uh, you had a, 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 a friend or a colleague teach you about biodiversity by taking you out in the wilderness and showing you the more different kinds of, of life there are, the, the, the stronger the opportunity is for life to, to become. Yeah, it's true. And and one of the um, 
things that I, I want to make a, very clear in this book is the power of diversity. In fact, an ecologist to a person will tell you that the biggest predictor of any natural life system on Earth, as far as whether it will be sustainable over a long period, whether it can come back over a disruption like a flood or a wildfire or disease or whatever, is the level of diversity that exists there. Diversity is an enormous strength in the natural world. And uh, it's, uh, it's something that has, as it turns out, by all research indication, an enormous um, effect on humans as well. I talk about how a massive study done just a few years ago of a million scientific papers, so these were written by scientists for fellow scientists, the vast majority of the ones that were really being cited most often, and so you could say had the biggest influence on the evolution of science, were the ones that were made up from a really diverse set of researchers. So gender diverse, racially diverse. And the reason is that all of us, given our background, will come to see the world based on our experience in a little different way. So if you and I had a somewhat similar background as far as our, our race and socioeconomic class and our education, we'll love hanging out together and we'll see the world in many ways uh, similarly. But if we get somebody who's had a very different experience, um, we have to work a little harder to understand how they're seeing the world. But when it comes time to creativity, uh, to talk about creativity and improvisation, we will be served, all of us, by having that kind of diversity. And, and this is really now understood to the level of um, researchers finding that juries, uh, court juries made up of uh, men and women, and again, different uh, racial backgrounds, tend to remember much more thoroughly what was said in the courtroom and process their deliberations more effectively than juries made up of all the same uh, people with the same experience. So the very diversity that's allowing nature to be so brilliant in its ability to thrive and, and respond to challenges in the environment, that's ours too. That's our superpower too. And so putting attention to that, I think, could be a, a, a wonderful way for us to f forge ahead with the challenges we face. Tremendous. And I, I, I appreciate the fact that you're making the connections to the lessons for humans, because I, I, although this is a book about what nature teaches us, it, it really does apply to, to life of, uh, for all of us as human beings go, going through the world, maybe in a more integrated fashion. You mentioned uh, uh, the, the earth has our backs. And you talk a lot about wildfires in here. Can you talk about uh, how important that is to to allow for the whole cycle to occur? Yeah, it's interesting. I, you know, I live in the in the West. I'm I'm speaking to you from just on the north edge of Yellowstone, and so this is wildfire country. Um, it's a, it's an arid part of the country, and beginning in the early 1900s we really felt that fire was an enemy because it was burning trees that could be used for, for other things, uh, certainly uh, burning board feet of lumber, basically. And so we launched this fierce effort to put out every fire. There was something called the nine o'clock rule that the Forest Service used that they promised they would put out every lightning strike fire by nine the next morning, which was ridiculous that no one could do that. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it suggests how, uh, how fierce and aggressive the, the reaction to fire. Well, as it turns out, we now know, and we've known for about 40 years now, that in the arid west, where there's not a lot of moisture, and so there's not a lot of bacteria, there are not a lot of microbes that break down the the trees when they fall down um, the way they do in uh, other parts of the country. Fire is, in fact, the only way for what's held in a dead tree to return to the soil and be available to feed a new flush of life. So by controlling fires for so long and putting them all out, we allowed um, lots and lots of fuel to build up on the forest floor. And that, along with uh, some issues having to do with climate change, with uh, warmer, drier weather, have created these really cat catastrophic megafires that we hear about all the time in California and, and elsewhere. So it, it was a great lesson to learn not only that the process and the system of nature is really quite wise, and if we, if we want to launch some sort of plan, perhaps the best thing to do is stand back and take a look at what's really going on and then act out of that. But the other thing that really uh, inspired me from having been around wildfire a lot is within a very short period of time, and I'm talking six to nine months, 
the forest is is on its way to thriving again after being completely destroyed by the fire. That ash contains super, super rich uh, proteins for the plants to use, and so they grow at lightning speed, which brings in elk in the case of where I live, and the elk are actually getting fatter and doing better. That means they have higher calf weights when they give birth in the spring, so better survival rates, and those uh, that supports the wolves and the grizzly bears. And so um, there again, a really wonderful example of how even in the, in the wake of what looks like total devastation, um, nature is tuned. And I would argue that humans are tuned to some extent too, to be able to get back up again and to not only survive those kinds of things, but to thrive in even deeper and more profound ways in the aftermath. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about healing the planet uh, in terms of recovering the feminine. Uh, I, I learned a lot about elephants from your book and the, the incredible intellect they have, but also about matriarchal leadership and elderly leadership. Yes, um, it's interesting that in mammals where the males and females are roughly the same size, um, female leadership is is the norm. And I have spent a lot of time uh, in the world of wolves here in Yellowstone. And, and you will see that while, of course, the male is, is, is extremely significant and necessary, it's often the female who's making the decisions about where the pack goes, um, when it hunts, where it looks for prey. Those are uh, often, not always, but those are often handled by the females. You mentioned elephants. In the case of elephants, um, that's a great example of how in a great many mammals, bonobos, uh, chimps, and certainly elephants, the, the females have a, a tendency to put their energy into brokering agreements, if you will, uh, between, um, let's say, members of the herd with a difference of opinion. So the females are very important in keeping a lid on what could otherwise turn into um, a, a, an injurious or even a deadly uh, fight or squabble between members of the herd. So not only are those matriarchs leading the herd when they need to find water, um, not only are they sniffing the air and always keeping an eye out for, for the presence of lions and uh, assembling the herd when they do detect lions present, but they're also doing this very, very important work of keeping the social wheels lubricated, if you will, within the herd, so that herd can be bo fully bonded and strong and work together cooperatively uh, as opposed to being at odds. So that's a very, very important um, aspect. You also mentioned elderhood, and that's a, that's a profound example of elderhood as elephant um, society. A, a matriarch will perhaps be 50 or 60 years old. Uh, she was brought up by typically her mother, who was a leader of the herd, and she will, when she dies, pass the baton on to her daughter after having kind of trained her. Again, not just in here's where the water holes are, but in that fine art of brokering peace uh, among the herd. And it's, it's really a remarkable thing to watch. And again, holds a lot of lessons for us, for us humans. You know, we, we, mm. we did get this lovely uh, self-reflective thought capacity. We have these frontal lobes in our brains. And so we have an option to look around at the world uh, as it is and, and say, wow, that's really quite useful. We, we could embrace that. We could align our lives with that. And, and this is, I think, what we're really being called, called to do uh, right now. Mm -hmm. And the, the chapter on uh, we live in a planet with energy beyond measure was really meaningful to me because I think we're, con we're concerned about climate change and we're concerned about what kind of energy is safest to use. Um, but the fact that it's just almost limitless is part of the miracle of creation. You're, you're so right. I mean, just thousands of times the energy we need in a given day falling to earth from, from the sun. So it's, it's fantastic, the abundance out there. Now, again, um, most of life has evolved to be very, very stingy with energy. It's used extremely efficiency, efficiently, and, and that's really because the work of turning that sunlight into green plant material or turning it into our cells as we eat the plant material, um, that, that, takes, that takes quite a bit of work to do. And so we do need to be efficient. But you're right. There's a tremendous amount of energy out there. 
And um, I, I'm very excited on uh, if, to, to see how we will continue to apply our intellect and apply our scientific inquiry into getting ever more refined and ever more efficient with harvesting some of these things that are are, are available. Uh, it, it's also interesting um, that there's been some significant advances in in hydrogen cell uh, development, and and that's a that's a, a a power potential that's just almost unfathomable with a, a nothing uh, for pollution other than than water as its as mm. its uh, side effects. So. There are a lot of things to be done. I don't think it's wise to hang all of our hopes on technology and think, oh, we don't have to change anything because technology will save us. That's a very, very risky game to play. But I think combined with a stronger alignment to what the carrying capacity of this planet is and what our obligations are to be in relationship on this planet with our intellect applied to technology, I think that's the path forward. There's there's so many great themes in this book, but I want to get one more in before before we're done in here in the last minute or so, and, and it has to do with this notion of abundance on the planet and and giveaways and uh, societies that engage in natural sharing and gratitude. What would you say about that in summary? You know, that's that's a that's a big bite to take off. <laughs> Well, you know, there's a wonderful philosopher from ancient China named Lao Tzu who said it is the way of nature to take what has abundance and give to that which does not. And the giveaway you talk about where indigenous and native uh, people in this on this continent will have celebrations where the people, the person being honored will actually uh, spread out a blanket of, of their possessions and give them away to whoever needs them. And it was it's thought that that particular practice was a way to, again, honor that aspect of the earth that Lao Tzu was talking about. That by doing a giveaway, we're simply showing our gratitude, we're showing humility that it's not all about us, and we're also saying that, hey, I've got this extra, I will supply this to somebody who doesn't have enough. Just the way trees share nutrients and carbon with one another through underground uh, fungal systems and on and on and on and on. So it was another way uh, that those people had to align themselves with the processes of how life really, really works on planet Earth. Fantastic. We have barely scratched the surface of this poignant book by Gary Ferguson, The Eight Master Lessons of Nature, What Nature Teaches Us About Living Well in the World. I was stimulated intellectually and emotionally by every page, and I recommend it very highly. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you don't hear our regularly scheduled broadcast, I remind you that you can catch us on our YouTube channel, Good Books Radio, Strong and Cook. Make it a great day. <laughs>